This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie, happy 2018. Same to you, Scott. And as I look out the window and see all the snow and ice that's on the ground here, all I can think of is 30 days till spring training. (laughs) Yeah. You know, guys like me and maybe you kind of gauge our life based on which sports season we're in and what sports season is coming up and what we have to look forward to. Yes. And uh, on today's show, we're going to focus on on a, a, a season that just ended, but uh, a another new beginning here in Missoula for uh, our former head football coach who is coming back uh, to coach the Grizz once more. To a lot of fanfare, right? To a lot to of a- fanfare and a little bit of criticism and uh, uh, the 37th Head coach for the University of Montana is uh, Bobby Houck, and uh, as you know, he spent uh, seven years here as head coach and had a a glorious uh, record on the field. You know, in seven years, he won seven uh, division titles. He went to three national championship games. He was uh, a three-time Big Sky Coach of the Year, left here, went to uh, UNLV, did not have as much success there as he had here. Although in four years he did go to one bowl game, and then and then uh, at the end of his tenure there, ended up becoming uh, well. assistant coach at uh, at San Diego State. And when the opening came about here, he applied and he's coming back. What's wrong? He didn't like the he didn't like sunshine. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask him about that, <laughs> considering the weather here and the weather in San Diego. But you know, it's a it's a, a fairly rare phenomena to have that happen out of the 5,100 head coaches. In NF in in, in uh, college football history, right? Only 180 have ever gone back to a school they coached at as uh, before. Is that right? So this is a rare, fairly rare phenomenon for Bobby. I like that actually. I like the fact that well, he's a Montana boy, so this is his thing. Yeah, and we're gonna you know, there's a lot of questions to ask him about. I'm more I'm more concerned not about the on field. I'm more concerned about the progress of his life as a coach and how does he deal with being under a microscope and. The highs and lows of uh, coaching and coming back to, as you pointed out, a lot of fanfare, but some criticism. There was a, there was a, a you know, campaign, uh, you know, a, a sort of a petition to, for him not to come back because during his tenure and shortly thereafter, there was some uh, student athletes who got involved in uh, in uh, some criminal behavior and uh, it got, uh, you know, sort of mixed in with uh, other things that were happening on campus with sexual harassment and. And to some people, bringing somebody back from that period in the university's history uh, um, is a problem, and they didn't. They wanted to move forward rather than, you know, in their minds, take a step back. So, you know, I think we we you know have to discuss that candidly with Bobby because I'm sure he's. Uh, I'm sure he has some heard answers about it and and knows about it and and has and uh, had to deal with that when he uh, when Ken Haslam interviewed him to be the next head coach and. Uh, and during his press conferences in the past. So I'm, I'm anxious to talk to him, but more about Bobby Houck, the man, than Bobby Houck, the coach. Yeah, I like that. That's what we're good at, Arnie. Yeah, we're I good at so. kind of uh, getting to know I don't the person. Make him cry, but I. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the Barbara Walters yeah, Barbara of KGVO. Walters. Yeah, Bobby, how do you feel coming back to Missoula, Montana? After this time period, uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's that, that's what I'm looking forward to today. Well, you know, it's a, and you and I know this. We're big sports fans. We come from a town where sports is everything, um, but it's professional teams. And you and I, you know, wring our hands and shake our heads when our teams don't perform. And you know, so coming here to Montana five years ago and realizing that the sun rises and or su- rises and sets with the Grizz, right? This is a big responsibility, right? And it's not about the money. I just saw that uh, John Gruden signed a contract, ten year, ten million a year, hundred million dollar coaching contract. There are college coaches out. Who did there. he sign with the Raiders? Yeah, he's playing going to be the head coach of the Raiders. But there are college coaches out there, Nick Saban and others, making in the range of four to six million dollars a year yeah, yeah. as a base salary to be a head coach in college. And you know we're paying uh, you know a base salary of one hundred eighty thousand. So you know it's, it's, it's for the love dip, of the game. It's, it's more for the love of the game here, and you know the love for the community and. You know, the student athletes, many of the student, a preponderance of the student athletes in our programs here, particularly the football program, are, are Montana born and bred players and gives them an opportunity to play at a, at a much higher competitive level. So, I mean, there's all those components 
to coaching at the uh, FCS level as opposed to the F, you know, BS level, the bowl. Well, you know, level. he was just joking. I just met Coach before. Uh, he's uh, he's recording on one of our other sister stations, and he said well, he's been up here three times in the last uh, or two times in the last week. And he goes, "I think I need to get on the payroll." Yeah, well, <laughs> you put him on. It's like ten dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah ten dollars an hour. Oh. All the donuts. All the, do- <laughs> all the car. Uh, anyway, yeah. he, he seems like an awfully nice guy. And, you know, there's something also, I think, about the fact that he is a Montanan and that he is a local, you know, a folk did, hero did, in the sense. he did leave here for a much bigger salary to coach at a higher level. And he wasn't successful. And you can't. But then again, you cannot blame a guy for wanting to better his situation. No. You know, or change up his scenery, which is the reason why you and I are out here. Well, it's also you got to you know, coaching. Viewers. There's a lot more passion around coaching than a typical job. But if you're in a job and you're making I don't know two hundred thousand dollars, and in the same job somebody offers you six hundred thousand or eight hundred thousand dollars, no one. Would criticize you for taking not at all, and it's also what time uh, you know the time of his life, like when you know where he is with his kids and his age, and uh, you know uh, he's in his forties. Then he's in his early fifties. Right. So now's a nice. This is a nice time to kind of transition back to the place where he he grew up and where he coached prior, and to bring a fresh perspective. Because then you know he's had what eight years or seven years of. uh, Well, he's been gone since two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. So he's had nine years of perspective out of Mark, out of Montana to bring that knowledge here. Right. So that's great. I mean, well, let's ask him about We're that and talk about, about that. We're definitely going to ask him and talk to him about that. Good. Um, you are listening to What Do You Know? Back, our first show of 2018, proudly supported and sponsored by Angle & Volker's Luxury Real Estate. Our good friend Dawn Maddox um, is a great sponsor of ours, and she loves our program. We love her. Anyway, we will be back with Coach Bobby Houck of the University of Montana Grizzlies after these words. All right, Arnie, we have the coach with us. Coach. How does it feel to be back? You know, I can't tell you how ecstatic I am to be back. And Did you look out the person. window oh, this morning and see the snow? I, you sure? <laughs> it's going to take a little getting used to. But uh, like I, I told some folks earlier, I said, heck, I grew up east of the mountains. This is nothing. There's, I know it's, it's nothing. It's, this weather's 20, nothing yeah, for you. It's 20 degrees warmer and the wind's not blowing 80 miles an hour. So we're all good. But, here. you know, after a few years in San Diego, your blood might have thinned out there a little bit. There is no doubt I have gone <laughs> soft. I just try not to admit it. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Why did you leave in the first place? I mean, you're back here, you know, and I, I mentioned it in the lead into the show. In the 50, there have been 5,100 head coaches in Division I football, and only 180 have gone back to the schools that they were at before. So you left, you're back. Why'd you leave? Well, you know, when I, when I, this is going to take me a second to, sure. to talk through, but when I, when I first took the job, uh, when I interviewed for it the last time, uh, one of the questions was, "What are, what are your goals as a uh, as a head coach?" And I said, "Well, I want to win and and put Montana on the map even further as best I can, and then I want to move on and try to coach in some Rose Bowls and see where it takes me." And then the other thing uh, that couples along with that, there the grass is greener sometimes to uh, to be glib a little bit, but when you're looking at those type of of pay raises and the type type of thing that some places are willing to pay you, I mean, you've got real world. Uh, decisions sure. to make for your family. Most you've people, got, yeah, you got four kids going to college, and right. you've got weddings that eventually to pay for, and right. all that stuff. So th- those are those are those are uh, big time family decisions as well. And so I think that would uh, lend itself to the fact that I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity to be welcomed back and have this opportunity to be at the place where I'm. You know, in terms of a professional career, I've been in good places. I've been mm-hmm. lucky to live and work in some awesome, awesome places. But the only place I'm truly happy is at my school. And right. to be back home is really a cool deal for me. Well, you brought up a good point. Most people would never be criticized for taking another job in the industry they're in for a huge pay raise. But there's an emotional attachment there because is. you're under the microscope, right? And, and you come off of, you know, you were here for seven seasons where you won the Big Sky. You went to three national playoffs. You were three-time coach of the year. You know, but there is that reality, which you pointed out. you gotta, you got to feed the family, and you got to plan for your kids going to college and weddings. and You do, we, and it's, it's sometimes it's hard to turn that stuff down. But um, along with that, like uh, people that matriculate out, whether it's kids that graduate, 
um, my affinity and love for the university has never waned. It's sure. just a, you know a different. Uh, you were following the grids when, when every, you were in your every week, LV. almost every day, and that that carried on the last few years at San Diego State. So. Um, were people I'm just grateful? Were fans and alumni calling you even when you were gone, saying "Come back, <laughs> come back"? You know, uh, it's depending funny on because with, whether we beat because, them yeah, on Tuesday or not. You were gone since 2009. But, <laughs> I would, you know, be, because of the fact that all the extended families here in the state, sure. I'm, I'm here a lot. Like I, I've been here every summer forever, right? No matter where I was working. Uh, I mean, since I got out of college, but uh, along with that, probably 90 percent of all my best friends in the world. Are in this state and a lot of them in this town so the contact uh is close and and consistent over the years uh since i've right. been gone and and you know people have been very uh very gracious in their willingness to to encourage me to come back that's Bobby, great what, what's what stood out about coaching the fbs instead of uh, fcs you know i get asked that question a lot when i went there too right um it, nothing you know it, it the, the X's and O's are, are the same. It's not like the coaching's a lot better. Um, sometimes you can recruit an athlete. I'd say the biggest difference is this. You can recruit guys that are maybe uh, farther along in their development coming out of high school than the kids are. Uh, the kids we recruit here are, are a little bit more of a projection, mm-hmm. generally, generally speaking. But, you know, I, I would say, and I said this, at, to, to I, I met with some uh, – funny looks and maybe some disagreement but our first couple of teams at unlv our last four teams at montana would have beaten by to death they would have beat them down and and beaten them by three and four touchdowns so uh you know this this place uh in this league there's good coaching there has historically if you look at uh big time coaching staffs nfl coaching staffs there's a lot of guys that uh uh have coached in this conference sure including your brother including my (laughs) including my brother including timmy (laughs) So let me ask you this question. And and numerous guys on the Eagle staff. Sure. Ken Flagel worked at Montana when uh, right. in the 80s for Coach Marty, Donovan. Marty Morning. Marty Morning, for example. Yeah. Who's so gotta, I have to ask you this. Recruiting uh, that, player. That's always a bad precursor. I know. I, know, I have to ask <laughs> Whether it's my mother or who's you. Who's waiting hey, You say you have to. I have to ask Who's pushing? Me. Who's, who's me. me. <laughs> so it's a burning question well, in your mind. The show is, you know. Uh, what do you know? What do you know? And I want to know. So when you're some would say very little. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're recruiting for an, an Afro American uh, a player, you're recruiting him at UNLV or you're recruiting him at San Diego State to go and go to a city that's fairly culturally diverse. What do you say to a player and his family when you're bringing a, you know bringing somebody in like like Lavander Seegers for example when you bring somebody in from there to a small town like Missoula which isn't as diverse as they're used to? What do you, what do you say to their families? Well. We talk about what this community is. I mean, I, I can make a, a definitive argument and win most of the time that this is the greatest college town in America. Now, does that mean everybody fits? Mm-hmm. Probably not. But we have to decipher if 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 parachuting a guy in here, whether it's from Oakland or from Valier, Montana, uh, how are they going to fit? And how are they going to assimilate into this place? Right. And one of the mistakes I think I made – you know, whether it's pie in the sky optimism about how things are or whatever is my my first time around here is sometimes I thought, you know, this is my town. This is my school It's very inclusive of everyone and everything at all times. Well, that's not always the case. I mean, it's kind of right. this is a this is a small college town in northwest Montana, and it takes the right cat to come in here from out of state. And it's it's not an ethnic question. It's a personality question. For me, right, mm-hmm. the so, character of yeah, the individual. Yeah, I mean, whether it's you know some surfer dude from San Diego, I'm recruiting may not fit here. Right, and so I'm, when I, when I address that question, it's it's more about the individual than anything else, and it has to be a fit for them. But for those that it is a fit for, of of all backgrounds and ethnicities, a good number of them stay. And never leave because it is such a special place. But sure. it has to be in their wheelhouse of what they're looking for in terms of quality of life, socially, et cetera, et cetera. Well, good example, that's Justin Green, who you came yeah, in here just, I mean, and then played in the, for the— How does it— for, Justin can be the mayor or the governor at some point. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's that he's, kind he's, of guy. He's that, he's that kind of guy. Well, how does it compare, actually, uh, Missoula with Las Vegas, right, which is— Well, it's, it's two different ends of the spectrum. <laughs> right, definitely. You know, and— and uh you know there is a there's a huge 
microscope here on our on our guys. I mean, that's just the way it is. And uh, having seen it as a college kid, and then as a, an employee, and then as the head coach, uh, it's interesting how how much they are under that right. magnifying glass. Whereas in Vegas, uh, you know, everybody in that it's a town of over a million people. <clears throat> the people that come there, it's abject chaos. Everybody who walks uh, right. in the door, drives in, flies in, whatever, and guys just blend into the woodwork. Right. You could walk around <laughs> yeah. there and not everybody yeah. no, no one knows. Not we, everybody yeah. would know who you were in Vegas. Yeah. Well, and we always joke when we talk about Vegas, because we have a, had a number of guests from Vegas, right. it's a very small town. You know, at the end of the day, it's a small town. It is. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody, and there's like 25 people that run the city. Right. And, well, or and, less. And, and being the head football coach there was interesting, because you get out in the community and do certain things, mm-hmm. you know, different, you know, whether it's fundraisers or or foundations or different stuff and because it's a city of one point whatever two million people you kind of expect to never see you always see the same exact people it's there's there's <laughs> twenty thousand people that are the core group of people that well, go to everything yeah, go to everything, everything, everything and support everything how is san diego state good. just as a, in, by way of comparison well uh a little different uh san diego's big yeah but still is kind of a beach beach community um san diego is San Diego State was uh, was an incredible place for me to work, uh, both professionally and a place to live. Mm-hmm. Um, but a completely opposite view in terms of scrutiny and passion about the football program. I mean, this, this place here now, this is like Lincoln, Nebraska, is my best comparison to it. I mean, right. people so. here care. Right. There is no apathy <clears throat> about Grizzly football uh, in this state, in this town, or with any of our alums scattered across the But in a place globe. like San Diego, you have a lot of distractions. You have lots yeah, of events right. going not, on. It's not the thing. You know, the games are all at night. and They've got you know, a pro it's, team. It's not the, yeah, yeah. or used to. Used right. to. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> but even even though, uh, you know, there's just so much going on, it's just not the it's not the same. Yeah. So you went from, what, 14 or 15 years as a head coach, and then you go to San Diego State, and you become a special teams coach, and then you know, become associate head coach under Rocky Lane. What was it like being under Rocky, and did, what you learned from him moving from one from a role to a different role? Yeah, there a couple things that, that came out of the three years at San Diego State, and it was the winningest three-year span in the history of the that football program that's been being played for over a hundred years. So things times were good, and uh, I think the the main two things that came out of working at State for Rocky is one is when you don't have enough success, like happened at UNLV. Uh, sometimes you get you get your foundation, what you think is the way to do business in college football gets gets shaken a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm not right, you know. And to go into San Diego State and see all the principles that you believe to be core values of having a good football team be held up and be exactly how that guy's doing it. I mean, it's obviously comforting to see eye to eye with your boss on 99% of everything. That's right, also, that's ma- great. also <laughs> makes it a good work environment. But to see that your core principles of how you build a football team and how you have success to be reinvigorated on that was really good for me uh, personally as a as a head coach. Sure. And then it the validated. Other, yeah, you know what validates you would... everything you believe and sure. or re- revalidates, you right. know. And the game hasn't changed. And then uh, – the other thing is to be back coaching a uh, position, even though I was the associate head coach, it was really recruiting an area, coaching guys, uh, getting your getting your hand down in the dirt and doing the doing the work was good for me to get back to my roots and and uh, do that again for a few years. That was highly productive for me as a as a coach. Good. What are you going to try to accomplish now that you're back? Well, we've got we've got a lot to do on a lot of fronts. Um, just simply in the football program to start with uh we've got to get a staff hired completed and everybody in place so when our guys come back off a break we have got to charge you know i know it seems like it's the first part of january but for us the september 1st is looming and we're on a countdown so we have a lot of work to do with our football team to uh to get going and we've got to get our guys we got to develop our team our attitude our mindset our scheme uh etc so we can put a good football team on the field next fall um, obviously, I think th- we're on a collision course, with, and I have not said this this way, but it just kind of popped into my right. head. We're in my mind, we're on a collision course with the championship. The variable is time, right. and I wish I knew exactly what that is, but yeah. it's a variable. And then, uh, big picture, we need to make sure that 
we assure people that the place to be in the state of Montana on fall Saturdays is Washington Grizzly Stadium. It's the it's the it's the greatest thing going. I mean, I believe that this is America's game in this day and age. People love it. Uh, kids love to play it. Uh, the people watch it on TV every weekend, much to the detriment of their marriage sometimes. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, you know, our stadium's the place to be. Get you know, get in there. We are going to have fun doing this. It's going to be great. And then the other thing we need to do is the University of Montana has been in a little bit of a a lull. And I believe that Grizzly football can be a part of bringing us back to a position where we are thriving. And I, I, I've said it a couple times, and I, I'm some soothsayer or p- predictor of the future, but I think starting now with Seth Bodner, our new president, uh, I think the future is really bright for the University of Montana. You're going to see an upswing sure. at the U of M. You have a president that's, that's a great younger. point. You have a president that's younger than you. God, <laughs> does that that hurts me now. I'm going I'm to claim to Nobody. be. I'm going to claim to be his age, but I am not. Unfortunately, so you've had a, you've had a great success at putting you know Montana athletes and and uh, Grizz football players into the professional ranks. But for a typical Grizz student. When he finishes his career here, what should he have learned from that experience? Well, there, there's a couple of things. One, in terms of just the football program with the students, you know, with our players, uh, you know, the NFL is a byproduct sure. of coming out of a, a strong program, just like any other profession. So we, when we recruit guys, we, we tell parents, we're, you're going to give us a boy, we're going to give you back a man. We're going to have somebody that's, that understands what it takes to be successful and has done some things that were extremely difficult while trying to be a good college student and get a degree. So when we recruit guys, they're, they're here to get a degree and play football and have great success in both and then go out and because of those lessons they learn in both areas to be productive. The other thing that I need to continue to emphasize and want to every chance I get reemphasize is the football program on our campus is for everybody, not just the guys playing and wearing the helmets. Right. We want our student body invested in our football program. We want our students, athletes, uh, to be assimilated in our student population, and we want every every kid on our campus to feel like Saturdays in the fall in Washington Grizzly Stadium, they're a part of it. That's we great. want them there. We want them with us. We want them to agonize when we lose. We want them to celebrate with us when we win. We want our students invested in feeling like they're mm. part of it. So it's, when they graduate, sure. they're into it just like our guys were as alums. Scott, and they, and, Scott I want to tell you this. I, you know, As you know, right. I taught for 17 years on campus. I ran yeah. the World Trade Center. And all that time, Bobby Howe is the only coach that ever came in to see me and ask how his students personally, with a clipboard, asked how his, <laughs> is how that his, right? How his students were doing? Uh, Could they receive? Is there any? Do they need there tutoring? Were no. <laughs> do they need help? And I had you know guys like Mark Mariani and Austin Mullins and uh, uh, Dan, good students. Dan Carter, <laughs> Jordy Tripp. But you were the only one. And all this is time. not and that's Faber not a, University. That's not a criticism of the other coaches, but that really showed me something that you took the time to do that. <laughs> well, we 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 actually do care about their. It's not you know some. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we want them to graduate, but. Uh, you know, I was over there yesterday reacquainting because there's a new there's new crew new, over yeah. there, and I want to I want to we'll, we'll have numerous uh, lads in the business school, right? Uh, and I I went over there and said, hey, I want you to know, here's my cell phone number. I want to know if they're not doing it right or not taking care of business, so we can <laughs> nip it in the bud. And that is a good thing. And and what I would say is going out the door last time, and I I uh, I'm proud of this. Our five year graduation rate the last couple of years we in. Uh, 08 and 09 was 90 percent on the football team and the reason i bring it up is mostly because it probably never happened again with the college football <laughs> team but it was good and uh great statistic uh, yeah it is a great statistic and we're really proud of that and that'll be our that'll be our landmark we're trying to achieve i don't know if we can never get there again let me uh let's do a quick id our coach uh, well we have coach bobby Houck here you're listening to what do you know on news talk kgvo proudly supported and sponsored by angle and volkers luxury real estate my question for coach is how do you keep your players focused meaning there are a lot of distractions uh, that they have between other students, social media, um, the nightlife. The, the you know, there's a lot of things that Missoula has that uh, you know we're very proud of. It's a fun town, but how do you keep these guys focused? Well, it's a you know it's a fine line because you know 
college, who wouldn't, if at the end of the three of us, if you had a button right there, a red button, you could push and send you back to your freshman year of college, you'd probably hit it and I'm take too much time to think about <laughs> totally. it. So we want our I guys. I try to hit it. Yeah, yeah. We, as I said, I sell this to recruits as the greatest college town in America. So we want our guys to actually enjoy being college sure. students here. So there's always a fine line. And, uh, you know, our, our guys are, it's interesting here because there is a lot of, uh, scrutiny and microscope on the football and everybody here is into it right they're innately focused on it they know that uh they need to be paying attention to their development as a player and making sure they're doing the right things and and people they they know that people will call them on it if they're not so i mean the environment here lends itself to to guys understanding football is important here and uh, our guys get that. I and you can keep them – f- get off of Twitter, get off of yeah, Instagram, well, get off of Facebook. That's the other thing in our first team meeting. I said, you know, there's certain things I'm not into a whole bunch. You know, I'm not really right. into drug use, and I'm real not into <laughs> social media, and I'm real not into uh, – really not into – uh, our neighbors to the east. So those were my three, <laughs> my three points in the, in the first team meeting. Right. So, so, yeah. so obviously <laughs> – you had to deal with because I watched the you know the press event and you know and obviously live in the community you know with majority of the people are ecstatic that you're coming back and I want to ask you about whether their expectations are realistic of you but then there are some people <laughs> yes, there are some, some people that that weren't so ecstatic right and there yeah. was a petition and and some people who thought the football player the football program played a, an inordinate role in some of the controversy that happened at the university regarding uh, sexual harassment and and problems in the community yeah I I agree and I, I mean I hear what they're saying and right. I, I have I have three daughters and a wife and frankly a son that's going to be on campus. So I worry about them all in regard to that. And if you look at that is a national issue. Right. It is. It's a national issue. It's not exclusive to Missoula or the University of Montana. Uh, but I would say this. I would say that it's, it's, pre, it's kind of a stretch to try to connect all those dots to the University of Montana. Right. And just from a personal standpoint. That's right. I mean, the last time I was here, I was here seven years and one – and. There wasn't, there wasn't a ton. Of, I mean, you know, run it more, throw it more, you know, win them all instead of losing 17, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Right. But uh, the last time I was here, I would say the major criticism of me was, hey, this is so structured, so disciplined. You're so hard on those guys. They think they're in the Marine Corps. You know, they just aren't. The, the boys just aren't having enough fun. You know, so it's kind of like, which one is it? <laughs> yeah, right, you know? yeah. Are they right. running a muck or are you running a, a boot camp? Right. So and I think we probably leaned a little bit more towards that side. In fact, when I left, one of the major points was we're going to loosen things up a bit. And, uh, you know, I just don't think that's the. Is that how you were coached, by the way? Uh, no, my, my <laughs> house was uh, starting as a high school uh, kid with my dad and then on into college. Your dad was a high school he football was, coach. And a, and a great one. One of the great greatest guys I ever knew. But. Uh, you know, I believe that our lads thrive with structure and discipline. They may not even be able to uh, right. enunciate that to you if asked, but when right. you're out of it, they flounder. So we are going to provide structure and discipline as we did the last time, and uh, we're going to operate in that structure. So do you feel the it's great? I mean, the pressure are the are the expectations realistic? I know people say, "Well, Bobby's back. We're winning." Here the, we go. Win we're, 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 we're in the national <laughs> win championship them game. Well, you know, I. Uh, as I always say, the the internal pressure, whether it's inside my head or chest yeah. or within our offices, is always nobody wants to win more than we do. So externally, expectation, uh, I just think that's great. I mean, the expectation is here to win championships, both internally and externally. And as I mentioned earlier, and I, I kind of like, I'm going to say it again because I'm proud of myself for phrasing it that way yes I but uh, I, I think we're on a collision course with championships here the variables time and if people will just give us a chance to uh to get ourselves lined out and ready to go we can we can make this uh oh, special I again sure i want to uh throw out some names and get your yeah. initial reaction to these names okay <laughs> this is recorded right now. <laughs> yeah, i'm just kidding <laughs> Mark Mariani. Uh, one of the great Grizzlies, a uh, guy that came out of nowhere. We didn't give him enough credit uh, for what he was going to become. We uh, treated him like he was honored to uh, step into the locker room, and all he did was become one of the great players in in uh, school history at his position. Obviously went on to great things in the NFL, but above all of that, uh, no matter how great a player Mark Mariani was here, he's an even greater person. 
He says to me, and I want you to validate this, that your greatest moment in, in sports was watching him hit a hole in one last summer. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it, that was awesome. Is that right? We fun, yeah. yeah, we were at a yeah. golf, uh, I was actually back here for a, uh-huh. a football fundraiser golf deal. Yeah. And Mark hit a hole in one, and we were having fun, oh, yeah. and we had a couple of adult beverages. But then they they headed down to Colt Anderson owns uh, the Missoula Mo Club. They headed Mo to the Club. Mo Club to really celebrate, and I did the old Montana exit, and, and <laughs> Stacy drove us up the lake. So they were sending me uh, pictures of. Uh, them toasting the hole in one, and, and I just said, "Hey, I'm too old for that stuff, fellas." Wayne, Wayne Hogan, Wayne Hogan's a great friend and a great guy, a uh, dynamic uh, uh, guy who was uh, really at a tough time at the university financially. Uh, kept this thing afloat, and I'll be eternally grateful to Wayne for bringing me here the first time because he had lots of options. And he didn't know me. He came out and flew out to Seattle and sat down with some uh, 36-year-old secondary coach from the University of Washington and hired me over Brian Kelly and some other guys. And uh, like I said, for giving me that opportunity career-wise and personally, I just always be grateful to Wayne Hogan. And he's in a great spot now. He's running the Florida Hall, Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah, and I mean. And to hobnob with he, all those doing guys. It, he, and he's doing exactly what he's, uh, he's special at. He's, sure. he's good at that job. Lex Hilliard. Lex Hilliard, uh, awesome guy. One of the, uh, he was the first guy we recruited when I when I got here. We took the job, and the next day we were in Lex's house in Kalispell. Uh, we thought he was a must get for us, being a Montana kid uh, from the western part of the state. We need him now. <laughs> yeah, we could use him again. And uh, uh, Lex was a guy who Joe, when he went to Wyoming, tried to recruit hard, and Lex sought. Uh, uh, in his future to to be true to his home state, and he just again all time leading rusher, touchdown right. guy, uh, lost one fumble in his career. One of the great Montana running backs, if not the greatest. Jordy Trip, <laughs> you know Jordy. There, there's all kinds of things with Jordy Trip. Obviously, uh, such a quality guy, third generation alum of our football team, starting with his grandfather Gene Jr. and his dad Brian. But uh, the class that we recruited. Uh, Jordy in with Ty Timmer, whose dad was a my roommate at basketball camp in the seventh grade and was a great Bobcat. When we signed those guys, it was the first time in my career that we were now recruiting uh, players that their dads were college buddies of mine. So uh, <laughs> Jordy, officially in my mind, with all the great stuff and what a good dude he is, sticks out in my mind as the designated time in, uh, in my career where I became old. <laughs> you mentioned Bobcats. <laughs> Jeff Choate. Jeff, I've known for a long time. Really respect him as a football coach. He is a battler. Um, I'll be looking forward to uh, the competition with those guys. Uh, had, uh, you know, my in my time with uh, Mike Kramer down there and Rob Ash down there, very uh, worthy adversaries. And Jeff is going to follow in that line of very worthy adversaries down there across the state. What was I'm, I am sorry to interrupt, sure. but what was your record against the Bobcats when you were here the first time? <laughs> five and two, but it should have been six and one. <laughs> yeah, it should have been. I'm, I don't, <laughs> it should have been. It was, it was five and two. We, as, you, uh, as you know, Scott, it doesn't matter what happens uh, in the rest of his oh, life. I know. He's judged uh, by how well, how many times he's beat the but Bobcats. We, uh, we won the we we. Uh, we outgained him something like 430 to 167, uh-huh. 20, 27 first downs to nine and lost to him down there because we jacked it up, which was very, as time wore on, was very uncharacteristic of our teams. But uh, they got us, and then they got us in 2005 down there. They were better than us in 2005. Uh-huh. They, they were better. How come? Travis why? Lule was a senior. Lule they, was a hell of a they quarterback. Were, they were just better. We were young, young, young. Sure. And we just, frankly, weren't very good. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and then the next, the last four years we were here, we won and won uh, going away pretty much. Uh, it was it was more fun. Why? <laughs> related, it's certainly more fun. Related to that, even though you weren't here and you were seeing what was going on here in Missoula with the last two years, why do you, why do you think these guys didn't weren't able to kind of put up a better fight? Well, you know, those were good games. Those were good games. It wasn't like there was some some stomping going on out there i mean they're right they're highly competitive games i mean you know they've got they've got scholarships too they've got good coaching 
they work hard. Those their kids care about the game too. Yeah, their fans care about the game. Believe me, maybe even more so than ours. So it's everything to them too. It's the most important game on their schedule. And you know the interesting thing to me, and you know the playoff structure was different. Mm-hmm. When I, and this I'm getting off topic a smidge, but yeah. uh, the the playoff structure was different back then. You didn't have the open date for the top eight, which we would have been in six out of seven years. And for us, we put so much into that that game, the the rivalry game, that the next week and Thanksgiving weekend, it was always right, the smallest right. crowd, and um, it was really hard for us to get it up to to play that game the week after the Bobcat game. So I think you know more teams get in now, right. which makes it easier to get in. But also you have the ability to, if you win enough, to get that first week off. And for us to have a week in between the Bobcat game and uh, the first round of the playoff that we sure. had to play in would, be, would have been huge for us. Like we got upset in 2007 in the first round by an option team, Wofford. Oh, uh, I hated that. And we game. were we were undefeated. I hated it too. You know, one of their triple option team, which is problematic to start with, we're coming off the Bobcat game, mm-hmm. uh, and we were twelve and zero, I think, at the time, and we just we didn't play well. And I think if we'd had a week off, that was our best team, two thousand seven, from a talent standpoint. We, that was a gr- that was a great, great, great mm-hmm. football team. And we got upset, and you know, I mean, even to the down where we they score with twenty seconds left, and we get it down the field, and we get a guy who's kicked in the Pro Bowl a chance, and his unfortunately hit Dan Carpenter's last yeah. kick of his Grizzly right. career is yeah, outside miss. the left post by a foot and a half, and we had a chance to save ourselves and move on. I, I think that was the best team in the country that year, and we got wow. upset. But I think part of that issue was the fact we put a lot into that last game of the regular season. But also, you pointed out when you play in a team like Wofford, who runs, and they ran it very well. Yeah, they were good. Offense that you, I mean, I was on the third row. I couldn't see the ball half the time. <laughs> well, you know, they 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 were excellent at at true triple know, extra, option stuff. Yeah, yeah. totally. Well, and let's we just didn't see it. Well, related question for the coach: What do you who do you see in the division now? That's kind of uh, like Eastern Washington or other teams that you're kind of looking at and yeah. I, I mean, I what think are your thoughts? Big, I mean, I think in the Big Sky, we're right there in the mix. Mm-hmm. That's, I think we're we're one of the we'll. We'll be one of the better teams, um, but we need to get back to being the best team that everybody is trying to catch. Sure. That's what we need to do. Right, we're not there right at this moment in time. We're not there, but I, you know, I watched the I watched the FCS championship game a couple times last weekend, and very familiar with uh, those were those, two, teams. those were two good teams. Yeah, and real familiar with James Madison. Yeah. Uh, I, and, as we should be, and uh, you know, we've we've got some work to do to catch mm. those boys. Those lads. Well, I remember are, even when we played James Madison, they just had that huge offensive line and just kept, you know, they we couldn't stop the run. Yeah, they in were that difficult game. in in two thousand four, and yeah. then we went back there in in uh, two thousand eight when they were ranked number one in the nation in the semifinal and, and beat them. Right. Uh, yeah, that, those <laughs> those were great football games. Mickey Matthews, their head coach, is a dear friend, and those were battles. Sure. Uh, both in uh, and those teams, and you know, you know, east of the, you know, east, uh, east of the Mississippi, play a different kind of football than we play out here. They do a little bit. They've they've got a different uh, model, different yeah. recruiting base. But but Madison's yeah, in a college town in the mountains too. It's got yeah. some, and they've got gr- unbelievable facilities and stadium, and they got some real similarities to us. What do you so, think of our new facilities, by the way? Unbelievable. I mean, the thanking, I can't thank the people that. The sure. owners that got that done, and all the guys in the in our administration that helped push it through. I mean, obviously, specifically the Washington, fam- Washington family with a major gift to right. get that thing done. But you know, from a recruiting standpoint, it's beautiful. It's going to make a huge difference. I mean, it's a it's a game breaker for us in recruiting, sure, as well. But from a functionality standpoint, in terms of developing our players and giving them some place that's that's just better than the other teams in our conference it's really cool right. because right. before i don't think you know we never talked about it because it was kind of productive but before that was built our facilities were the worst in the conference our locker room meeting rooms weight room the worst in the big sky conference right if you can imagine so that thing brings us out of that where you know kids would come in on recruiting vi- visits and we wouldn't show them the locker room and the weight rooms oh it's being clean there's new carpet <laughs> <and> some, <laughs> you know they're fumigating whatever yeah, yeah. we would not go down there so this thing now we got a showpiece that'll 
help us in recruiting, but it'll make us better as a team. It's it's a, exactly. Does it rival UNLV or San Diego oh, it's, State? It's better. Far, 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 far superior than either one of Good those. Good to know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, – it's, it's a state-of-the-art I mean, the facility. Old, the, only, the only people in the Mountain West Conference that have anything that compares are Boise and Colorado State. Wow, that's a big. That's great to know. Yeah, it is, and it's a. It's a. It was a great job, well done, uh, and very, very thankful to the people that donated to get that thing built. Sure, Arnie, well, you, you have more questions. I know that we have to wrap it up with the coach, but you have a few more people, right? Well, I have a few more people, but I would rather. I want to focus on a couple of issues. A bigger fish, pick, uh, bigger. No, we okay, coach? Issues. On time? Can you take, take handle, more, handle these issues? Yeah, I want to talk about. <laughs> I do have some recruits coming in. By the way, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll let you out of here. Yeah, and we have a game coming up in September against Northern Iowa. Uh, that's which we're right. We're, we're on already on in the circle, clock, baby. We're on the clock. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about officiating, and I don't want you. To, I mean, I'm not asking no, you to I, criticize. No, be great. It, it, it looks to me as if it's changing, and the officials are playing a more active role in the pace and the outcome of games because of replay and because of the way they call their they're calling plays, particularly yeah. on things like pass interference or uh, on kickoff returns. I mean, you were a special teams guy. It looks like a third of the you know kickoffs are called back because of, uh, you know, put, you know, you know, blocking in the back or whatever. Am I wrong or am I uh, right about? You know, the referees would say, "Well, if you don't want holding called, then don't, don't hold. Don't, hold, you yeah, know, or don't, know. don't block." But the it's back. such an objective uh, call it, in most cases. It is. Um, you know, uh, those guys have a big job. There's a, there's there's eight of them in a crew now, so they got they have their eyes on 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 every they they see most everything. Some of it is subjective uh, on on what gets called and what doesn't. But uh, you know, I, and I would say this. The worst people to ask about the rules in general, in my experience, is our coaches. Coaches, they don't know the rules. <laughs> I, I, sat, I was on the AF American Football Coaches Association <laughs> Rules Committee for seven years. Coaches, don't, they don't know the rules. I mean, they think they do. They right. think they're authorities on them. They don't know. The, the referees know the rules. And, you know, they, they spend time and, and our, our, our governing body right. uh, as coaches, as well as the NCAA uh, play com, playing committee, they uh, they they research everything every year and they tweak the rules a little bit and then the referees and all our Division One conferences have good training and they give up a lot of their time every summer and a lot of their their personal time with their families specifically in July uh, as well as in the spring to try to get educated on the new tweaks to the rules and how to how to call it and you know I I think if you're smart you you educate your players on how things are being called to try to um, preclude them from getting penalized in certain situations. Now, it's not going to be completely clean uh, in terms of holding and everything else, but that's the way it is. The one thing that I that I don't like is that I think that our our supervisors of officials, both on the national level and at the conference level, have a tendency to ask our referees. They're watching the wrong stuff a lot of time. You know, don't they're so worried about the sideline and all this other nonsense. I want them to worry about what's going on on the field. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't I don't really care about the socks or that stuff pregame or some guy's jawing with another guy. I would just assume you refereed the game rather than worry about the ancillary stuff. So that would be my one complaint. Good. But that, com- that comes from the, the higher-ups. We're so happy to <laughs> have you and get your insights into things that are happening with our Grizz program. Yeah, as you know it's the lifeblood of Missoula, Montana, and and you know parts of the rest of the state as well. Grizz fans everywhere, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, what September second against Northern Iowa. To first, see. first, first. I believe Northern. Is the schedule out yet? Yeah, it's yeah. out. Have you okay. already, have yeah, you I'm already okay. have you already scouted Northern Iowa? Have you taken a look at their team? We haven't. We'll uh we'll do that after spring recruiting. So late May, early June we'll we'll get the first three opponents pre scouted and ready to go before we Good. have camps and vacation. But I, I'm as you, you can sense, I'm thrilled to be back. We gotta pump it up. Montana Tufts back. Let's get everybody out there and have fun this fall. We love it. You get us pumped up just talking to you. Thanks for being on the show. And, Coach, I'm going to ask you one thing. Will you come back and visit us before the season starts? I will. Okay, you see now I Count got me that. in. <laughs> Count me in. It's on record, too, right? <laughs> yeah, it's on record. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Yeah, really appreciate it. Go Grizz. All right, we'll be right back, Arnie, with our final words. Wow. You know, that's part of the reason why it's good to have Bobby come back. I mean, he has... A different appreciation 
for right. for the experience. Not only because he's older and wiser, but he's had some he's had some time to look back on the experience. And right. as you could tell from the interview, he remembers plays and games from you know 2004. That's a long time ago. He remembers how many yards they how many yards they got and what they messed up on. I, I mean, like he's, it. He's passionate about the game. Obviously, his father was a was a football coach, and he grew up in a in a, you know a sports family. And he's coming back, and I do think he has something to prove again. Sure, you know it's a great challenge to come back and try to emulate in a different set of conditions, different teams in the Big Sky. Maybe there's more parity now, but he wants to you know make the Grizz tough again and be the leaders of the conference. And, and he wants to leave. He wants this is you know we didn't ask him this, but it felt like he's like he kind he came back and this is going to be his thing. You know he's making this the rest of his career. It feels I, like I, I think so too. I, I, and that's great. I mean that's a that's a that's a good thing. Well, to it's good for shoot recruiting for. players. It's sure, good for the uh, it's good for the community to know. Yeah, I mean this is a tough coming community. home. I mean, he was in three national championship games, and and people, you know, when he Still, left, right. said it's good that he's gone. He couldn't win the big one, right? I mean, let you know. Let's face it, most college programs would be happy to have the record we've had in the last three years. Even seven and four season is not is a good right. season for many teams. When I went to college at University of Cincinnati, we only had one winning season in four years. We were happy to go six and five. Right. It was like a moral victory. Right. Here, seven and four gets you fired. It's <laughs> you incredible. It really, the, the, the expectations are very high, and there's, and, and there's strong expectations about the cross-state rivalry with Montana State and beating those guys. And they have the same feeling towards us. I mean, the schools are you know, you know, roughly about the same size, and, right. and, and they have the, probably just about the same fan base. Oh, I think the Grizz fan base is a little bit bigger because right. we've had more championship but seasons. But, but, but it's uh, it's a tough place to be under the microscope. And and you need a tough coach and a guy that understands all the complexities of that well, to actually when he lead lived, the team. When he lived in San Diego, or even when he was head coach at UNLV, sure he was recognized at sporting events and public events that he was participating. Right. In. But when he just went out with his wife and kids to dinner someplace. No one knew who he was. Right, right. Here, he can't walk anywhere without someone patting him on the back or giving him some advice about what he did wrong. Or, or buying him a needs. drink. Yeah, or <laughs> buy him a drink or what he ought to do right. To, you know, which quarterback he ought to start, what, which play he ought to run. People are that invested in the football program. I've never seen anything like it before. You know? It's interesting. Well, Missoula is a special place, and surely they would be special with their football team. Too. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, yeah, again, I, 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 I'll walk back on that a little bit. There are programs like uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, you know, they, they, I, I know some people who are big supporters, and they were crushed. Alabama, when they lost to Alabama, right? You know, the Alabama folks also because absolutely because there's not a lot SEC of, in general. Yeah. But here, it's like every day. You know, an off season, waiting for the next game. You even knew it was September first. I was a day off. A, it there's is a, incredible, actually, if you think about it. Well, the sun rises and sets to this team. You know, and, 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 and it's football. And Bobby. Even though we're putting a great basketball product Bobby, on the floor. Bobby was 80 and 17 during his tenure. It's a tremendous record. I mean, every year he either won or tied for the conference championship in seven years. From the first year. What he mentioned to me that I didn't know, which I was very, found very surprising, was he thanked Wayne Hogan and said he had a lot of other options, including Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly became... You know, Notre Dame head coach. Wow. You know, I mean, he was, uh, you know, he was, they were big time competitors. And Are you going to start coming out to the field, uh, to the game sure, again? Sure, sure. I was a season ticket holder. And I'll I be know one you again. are. I'll I know be you. one again. You know, back in the day when I started being a season ticket holder, not every game was televised. So if you really, you either were going to listen right. to it on the radio or go. Uh, but but no, I'll be back because because I personally think that Bobby has, has the right Grizz Chemistry. I'll remember that, Arnie, our since we're neighbors, and I'll take yeah, you to the game. To, you'll be able to see me. I'll driving. be your designated driver. <laughs> 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 well, look, I think that uh, the, what's also striking to me was the man that was sitting before us or standing before us is as real as it gets. He's not. He's not holding back. He's not. It's not. He is not media trained no. to where he's throwing out answers that no. are like. Well, and, our questions and also were a little bit off the normal beaten path. <laughs> Good. Well, that's yeah. what we're going to, and we're going to have him back before the season sure. starts. Well, this is his. As I looked at it, I, I said, "This is his Steve Job Apple moment." You know, remember when they brought it Steve yes. back to Apple? <laughs> you know, this is bringing him back. 
And let's see what happens. I mean, you know, we're all excited, but we should not expect miracles. He can, not you know, the beginning. You know, till his till he can bring his players that he wants onto the team. You are correct, sir. And we will now wrap it up. Arnie, thank you. Great show. Hey, Glad we'll that we're back. Week. 2018. Arnie, who's on the podcast this week? Well, we have uh, we have a Michelle Yui from Vim and Vigor, who we interviewed Love on her. this show. Um, and then we have a few more we're going to tape. And next week we have uh, Jeff Fee, who a former CEO of uh, Providence Healthcare and twenty year healthcare expert, coming on our show to try to help de- demystify to our listeners what is going on in healthcare and what they ought to be paying attention to. Looking forward to seeing Jeff. All right. Remember, we are supported and sponsored by Angle, Angle and Volker's Luxury Realty, Don Maddox, good friend of the show. And we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. 